My name's Lindsay England. Um, so, are you originally from Bradford? Yes, uh, I, I uh, emigrated to Manchester 20 years ago for, for work and, uh, and, and relocation for all my purposes. And what, what is it you do? I do security. Oh, okay. Uh, In Manchester? At, at present, um, for the last five years, I've been doing the, the, the same venue, which is a homeless refuge in Bowler. Oh, so right. I, I okay. commute every, every night to do a night shift. Oh, right, okay. And what brings you, have you, obviously you love Bradford, is that the men's team and the women's team? Yes, yeah, so um, originally I, I grew up being a Bradford City fan from the age of eight, um, followed the mighty Bantams all over the world and all, all our ups and downs and, and exploits, including getting to the Premier League. And the fire, the famous fire. Yeah, yeah. of course. And that um, the, the season that we uh, we got promoted to the Premier League, I'd been working part time quite a bit for the club, doing ticket offices, but mainly running the, the coaches and that, and that also the supporters club. And that that season, so uh, I got to go out with the team on a on a, a discounted, shall we say, holiday. Um, that season when we got promoted, which is great because we saw St Kitts and Nevis, and we played the uh, local St Kitts team and also the Canadian under 23 team out there. Uh, and that. Traveled with the men's team. Uh, what kind of places did you travel? Yes, so we we, we got over to the uh, to St Kitts and Nevis, uh, and also St Lucia on on the way back when, when Bradford City got promoted and that. Uh, Got all, up to all sorts of shenanigans with the team. Most of the stuff, all uh, what goes on tour stays on tour, and that. But uh, we, had, we had some crazy times up there. But was welcomed by the locals out there, and even even um, media teams from here in in Australia were following us that season because oh, yeah. it was a massive, massive thing, thing for Little yeah. Bradford City to get promoted to the Premier League. And, so, and yeah, you know, we've had good times and bad times at Valley Parade. But even though I've been living and working in Manchester 20 years. I still have a season ticket uh, and so I still go back to as many games as I can because like, the money just goes to the club so yeah. if, uh, we're working nights if I can't get back the money still goes back to the club Yeah. so um, and, and I followed and supported um, the women's team for a few seasons through the village to be born on and, okay. and, that, and it, it was just you know what everybody did and, and you know, did you follow in the 80s did you follow the women's team much a little bit but like i say like mo mostly at that time i, I was i was playing rugby league myself I was okay the Halifax women's team and uh, the first ever uh, you know a chance for the first ever great britain squad that was set up in 91 um, that didn't come to much and they didn't officially play a test match until 96 by that time i'd injured my cruciate ligament and had to retire oh. But we, but we had some great times, you know, playing in Challenge Was that finals, unprofessional or did you roles. get... Was it unprofessional? Or? Yeah, of, of course, everything had to be paid for yeah. back then. And that's so like, I was treasurer's front secretary as well as playing and everything. And, you know, chauffeuring everybody around in the van. I had a van in those days and he just threw everybody in the back with the kit to get from A to B. We was watching the kit ourselves. And when, when ourselves. did you... We the LBG... When did you? So, so um, just a ball game. Um, I've, I've been campaigning myself since like 2002 under my own name, and then by 2010, I realised that I needed some sort of an organisation behind me to take things a little bit further because we weren't being taken seriously. So uh, initially, just a ball game started as, as a blog in 2009 um, under the name of Roberto Carlos's thighs. So any football fan who's of their worth will know what that means yeah um, and, that, and then i realized i had to be taken seriously so i changed the name to just a ball game so we'll, we'll be celebrating our is that 13th, what it's called just a ball just game. A ball game yeah we'll be celebrating our 13th birthday in november this year november what november the, the 9th okay yes yeah, so where, where are you going to be celebrating that would it be um it might be hopefully um it's going to be at the national football museum oh in manchester and, uh, yeah, yeah so we, we do some project with work with them every now and again so i curated the first ever lgbt tour of the museum a couple of years back um, and we've done some work with our giant flag that we also brought out so we, we've brought some of our resources out in, including a, a giant football well, an inflatable football and a giant inflatable, a 20 foot flag which had 4,500 signatures that we brought from, from England. We've been to several Lionesses games and WSL games before we came out. Got lots of people to sign it, including the British High Commissioner here, uh, 
in Australia, um, people like uh, Dawn Butler and also uh, Deputy Labour Leader Angela Rayner signed it before we came out and we got to hand it over to the, the Lionesses and Serena. Uh, so is this the big boot? No, this is a giant flag. Oh, giant flag, yeah, so okay. This is, this is a 20 foot flag that we had and it's got like 4,500 messages of good luck on it. Okay. To, uh, from and the fans. when did you hand it to the England squad? So we handed that over prior to the second game. We went to the training in session up in Gosford. Uh, the FA invited us up there to be able to hand it over because obviously the preparations were too intense for the to, yeah, to get for to them before the yeah. first game. Uh, but there was an extra couple of days in the second game, so we went up there to hand it over. Handed it over to Serena and to Millie Bright. Did you get pictures with them holding the flag? Yeah, up? yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Well, we got we, we got pictures of us handing it over. We're waiting for other pictures to come back from the FA at the moment. Yeah. And what's happened to the boot? You did you've not bought the boot here today. To be in the fan park, unfortunately. So just why, like why? UEFA regulations last year, <coughs> it's the same with FIFA. Although I've been negotiating um, over the last four years to have an official LGBT hub. It, at a FIFA World Cup for the first time, you know, be it near the stadium or be it at the fan park, but unfortunately, uh, FIFA just like you wait for the restrictions <laughs> of uh, 150 metres. You know, anything rainbow, anything remotely resembling anything to uh, promote an LGBT plus inclusion organisation like ourselves, even though we're grassroots, we don't have any core funding, and that they see it that their partners like like your McDonald's, like your Visa, like your PepsiCo, and think that they'd complain that they're getting that we're getting free advertising. They don't understand that small grassroots non-profits and charity charitable communities need that bit of a lift. And because none of these massive companies are doing anything LGBT themselves, especially at the finals, when probably 75% of the women who are playing, just like 75% of the women who are, who are here supporting, uh, are going to be LGBT plus. For, you know, they're either going to be gay women or they're going to be bisexual women or identify as mm. something other, maybe trans women. Or... And what was it when you uh, had a meeting with them? What was it they actually said? It was to do with. Uh, yeah, sponsorship. It's it's, no, it's seen as being political. Oh, okay. And if LGBT, it's seen as being political, not a human right, which of course it is. Yeah. And, uh, and so they put restrictions on you, just the same as UEFA did last year for the Euros, even though they were held in England. So we, thankfully, Wigan Council through GMB, which is my trade union, supported us to have a small stall in the market in Lee for the games that were up at the Wigan and Lee Stadium, but we had to be 150 metres away from the fan park and also from the stadium and that. So we weren't allowed to take part and lots of the fans missed out and didn't know that we are there. But those that came along took up the resources, had the photographs taken, and we were grateful that we had something like a, a giant rainbow boot yeah. to, to promote. Um, and how long ago did you contact FIFA to sort of well, I, I've, the irony of it is that I've been doing work for FIFA for several years um, through, the, through my anti-discrimination work and then four years ago um, Megan Rapino got voted the, the, the best it, and for those awards FIFA actually flew me out to Milan for three days to do some filming with Megan Rapino to create this story about being fans and, and being LGBT and looking up to, to important people within the women's game who are our, our idols and everything. And Megan Rapino was out and she was the best that, that season. So they, they, they film you to do something like that and you have you involved in like that, but then four years on when you want to showcase all the great LGBT plus work that you're doing and the inclusion work and get people to understand what it's really all about, you're then not allowed to bring it to Australia for the Women's World Cup. And, and, the, te and the team's players and backroom staff are not allowed to wear anything rainbow either, which is just ridiculous. And she can see that I've got plenty of rainbows with me today. And um, what is it they're actually wearing, for people who don't know? Instead of the rainbow armband, what are they wearing? So some of them are wearing the, um, the inclusion armbands that FIFA have created, but they're to, make, to mean different things. I mean, e even, even last year in Qatar when they created the One Love armband, that was nothing to do with LGBT plus inclusion. That was a standalone venture which included different anti-discrimination things, it in including uh, black and brown people and their fights and their struggles which of course are important and need promoting but 
being LGBT plus and showing the inclusion for that needs to be standing on. There's still a lot of opposition. I've, 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 I've even t today, two things today. Yeah, I woke up this morning before I came to this game. We flew out to Kuala Lumpur as a stopover for, for several hours before we got to Sydney <laughs> when we flew out a month ago. And um, we're going to have to be a little bit careful going back because obviously the can over my hair because they've now passed a law today in Kuala Lumpur to say that if you wear an LGBT plus swatch then you can be jailed for up to three years. Something as ridiculous as that because swatch are putting out an LGBT plus inclusion watch and if, you, if you're seen wearing it now in Malaysia they're going to jail you. On, the, on, the, on another scale again um, some of the chiefs in Ghana have announced um, that they, they dragged a young boy into the streets, tipped snaps up over his head and then sacrificed a goat and put the blood all over his feet. He was a young boy and he was wearing feminine clothes, so they arrested him and then paraded him around the town and, 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 and sacrificed the goat to ward off the evil spirits. And then, you know, pe that people were saying, all these chiefs and leaders in Ghana were saying like, homosexuality is an abomination and it, it's not um, it's not a right-wing thing it's a left-wing thing so it can't be human rights because it's human lefts and all these crazy assumptions that they're going around and saying like if women from the west want to sleep with animals then fine but we don't want it here in Ghana and if men want to sleep with men in Ghana then we're not going to allow those laws to happen and to change over here it's all modern western culture and uh, the Spurs striker, uh, when they sort of backed down, how, how did you feel? Yeah, I mean, it, at the end of the day, again, it's somebody like Harry, Harry Kane's choice, but don't just have a think about what you're going to say before yeah. you say it. If you're going to make a statement and say that you're going to wear something or you're going to promote an LGBT plus community, and you always will, don't make those statements if then, when obstacles are going to put in your way, you're going to actually back down from doing it. Because there are ways around it, like I said, about someone could get a yellow card. And yeah, or they could have yeah. all worn the rainbow laces, you know, yeah. or they could yeah. have worn rainbow armbands. We could have, we could have given them the, these, these ribbons willingly to put on the tracksuits as they're warming up, things yeah. like that. Yeah. They could have done other things while they were out there. Yeah. On another <laughs> scale again, um, some of the chiefs in Ghana have announced um, that they, they dragged a young boy into the streets tipped snaps up over his head and then sacrificed a goat and put the blood all over his feet. He was a young boy and he was wearing feminine clothes, so they arrested him and then paraded him around the town and, 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 and sacrificed the goat to ward off the evil spirits. And then, you know, pe that people were saying, all these chiefs and leaders in Ghana were saying, like, homosexuality is an abomination and it, it's not... Um, it's not a right-wing thing, it's a left-wing thing, so it can't be human rights because it's human lefts. And all these crazy assumptions that they're going around and saying, like, if women from the West want to sleep with animals, then fine, but we don't want it here in Ghana. And if men want to sleep with men in Ghana, then we're not going to allow those laws to happen and, and to change over here. It's all modern Western culture. So how have you... Were you quite shocked that FIFA wouldn't allow you to bring the football in? Not really, because I'm used to it now. It's the powers that be, you know. I, I had meetings over in, in, in at FIFA in 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, went to their women's conferences and their inclusion conferences. And the likes of Infantino were there and were more than happy to take one of these rainbow pins off of us, yeah. put it on his suit, and fair play to him, he wore it for the whole of the day at the event. Lots of uh, photographers from, from, you know, from the, the Press Association and from Reuters snapped him in it and it, and it was put out, but then it, it just um, goes along with the other, sadly, 211 na nations now that vote for where the next World Cup's men's or women's are going to be held, you know, and, and, and FIFA say that's a step forward because originally it was made by the EXCO, um, so the, so the FIFA councillors and their members who are part of the EXCO team, only like 32, maybe 35 of those people were making the decisions as to where the next World Cups, men's or women's would be held. So they said they've, they've listened to the pressure and people speaking out and changed it so that now all 211 nations who are 
who come under the banner of FIFA and that they make the decisions but because there's so many um, countries around the world sadly that have all these um, anti-LGBT um, statutes and that in their laws and things they're not going to vote for a country that's LGBT plus inclusive and, and like now the next Men's World Cup in the three years time it's, it's held jointly with between Canada, the US and Mexico. FIFA have already fined Mexico over 19 times for homophobic chanting. So why is it even being taken to Mexico? The Canadian states are going to be fine where it's held, but several of the American states also have LGBT plus laws where uh, you can be, um, you can lose your job basically for just being out and proud at work. It's that simple. World Cup. Well, we've got to wait for the decisions to be made on that one. Okay. Um, there's a couple of joint European bids being made, so hopefully. Play. things are going to be okay in that respect but then again it's going to be down to the fans doing it themselves rather than FIFA embracing you know why would you not want to embrace all those players and all those managers and backroom staff who are from an LGBT plus what, what about the players themselves couldn't they do more they're not allowed to simply like like last year the, the men were, were going to get yellow carded if they wore a rainbow armband or if they were, they were, they were love armbands, so they decided against it. But there was a way round that. They could have got a player who wasn't going to play much, got them to play, wear it, it gets a yellow, they take them off, get someone out. The, the there was, yeah, and it's like, and again, it is down to what you really mean and, and how your ethics really stand and your morals and, and everything. It's like if you say you're you're going to support an LGBT plus community, then you do it. And you do look it at Iran. Look at Iran when they supported the women. All them lot got arrested, and we don't really know what happened to some of the players. No, you don't. And, and unfortunately, you know, it's like I would rather have. Um, players from the men's team and, and, and management from the men's team not say anything at all yeah. right, or not make this the statement say that they're fully inclusive and they fully support if it's not going to actually mean that you know yeah. to, to be fully inclusive you've got to support lgbt plus rights around the world otherwise what's the point it's just meaningless words yeah. that, that you're coming up with the women will do for the next world cup well, I'm hoping it'll be more LGBT inclusive than it is here. I mean, fair play to the local people here in Australia, in various states and various cities have been doing their own thing. So um, for several months now, we've been teaming up with some of the, the ex-Matildas. So Moya Dodds, a good friend of mine, who's the, the first ever vice captain from the Matildas from when they first started in the late 80s. So um, I've been teaming up with Matilda and she she's um, put me on to other people locally here in Sydney um, also in Brisbane and Melbourne things have been going on along with Adelaide and right across the other side of Australia in Perth as well so we've been teaming up with, with organisations locally like Pride Cup Australia they've actually put on watch parties um, and basically you've got a lot of people from um, yeah, so, Sydney so Pride, Cup, Pride Cup in Australia they're an organisation that's been going for about five or six years now and they're, they're an inclusion um, an organisation for LGBT people around all sports. We've been teaming up with them for several months and sending out resources to them, to, to here in Sydney and also to Melbourne. And the good thing that they've done, even before uh, any of the group games had finished, right across Australia, as far away as Adelaide and Perth and, and Brisbane, and not just locally here, They'd also put on 120 uh, standalone events as watch parties for local LGBT plus communities to actually put their events on. Uh, there were some due to be sta staged here in Sydney. They got cancelled again because FIFA stepped in and were throwing their weight around and wanted to find them for having the local parties in the local communities on the outskirts of Sydney. Um, and fair play to the Pride Cup team because they uh, they got around that and they actually sorted things out and some of their events were allowed to go ahead, so fair play to that. Including one that's going to happen um, in Kinsella Hotel up on Darlinghurst Road, that's going to happen the, the night of the final. So if you've not got tickets to the final and you identify as being LGBT+, you can get online now and, and follow the Pride Cup team. The details are there to sign up to a, a ticket. There's a watch party be there and then they're going to have uh, music, food and entertainment on for the rest of the evening. So anybody leaving the game later on 
who's been to the final and you want to carry on the LGBT plus um, celebrations, you can come along and join it because the, the celebrations are going on that? the right. Where's the nearest stop? If you get the, the light rail that goes, or the bus that goes to Bondi Beach, or the light rail that goes to Moa Park, it's within walking distance there uh, in, in this country because I've been going to the Lionesses games and taking the flags around, my LGBT plus flags for, for 16 years. Um, and of course the LGBT groups that were set up, when four of them set up, like um, I think the Spurs, Arsenal, Norwich and I can't remember the other one, it might, it might have been Man City or something. They didn't set their groups up until uh, 2013. So, uh, you know, I'd been having the LGBT flags across in Germany to events that I'd been invited to that were run by um, ex-goalkeeping hero Bert Troutman. And that, and, and I've had my LGBT flags there and my, and my t shirts and that. Like the Women's World Cup in 2011, I had the same flag up in the stadium in, in Wolfsburg and, and other places, Frankfurt and that in Germany. So, you know, we, but because there's only like one or two people in the in the groups, they don't call it a group, so which is really oh, sad. Oh, yeah, because you could have a treasurer and a, so you could have but three then, people minimum yeah, but, in it. But since then, other LGBT groups have sat up and they've just been like one person running it. So, you know, so technically we were the first ever to have an LGBT. Yeah. Uh, so they've not recognised you? Organisation, oh. no, but we. We don't bother being part of that Pride in Football yeah. crew because it's like if you have to stand to attention and jump to what they say, it's not fair when it's supposed to be grassroots and you're yeah. doing it yourself. Yeah. So, Do you think it's a northern thing? <laughs> because you're from Bradford City. Oh, but no, not, not just so much that. It, you know, OK, it's not fashionable maybe to be a Bradford City fan compared to a London club or anything, but... Um, and we don't get the immediate attention certainly that the London clubs do or the uh, the intake of members and that but we just do it as a membership on, on social media because um, we, we still did a lot of firsts actually so through Bradford City's LGBT fan group we had the first ever safe space um, we used the Bradford Brewery so when we set up our LGBT fan group in 2015 um, we use the Bradford Brewery as a, sp a safe LGBT space for any sports, not just football. Anybody who came to Bradford to watch sport as a home or away fan, you could come to the Bradford Brewery and it was a safe space. And we had LGBT inclusion stuff around the, around the brewery, in, in the bar and things like that. And we even got them to, to brew their own beer. We even had our very own LGBT Bradford City beer brewed. And things like that and so it was, it was amazing to walk in one day when after they had launched it and it's there on the pumps with its own little um, pump clip and everything like that and that and we, we had t-shirts printed and, and that to promote the brewery back we did some exhibition things there and it lasted really well until unfortunately the, the brewery closed down you know post covid we've not been able to find anywhere to set up everything mm. again but it, you know it was a really good space and we used to put on different events there uh, and music events and things like that and tie it into football so. do you think uh you know sometimes uh fifa and organizations like that like to recognize other groups where they agree with you know, if they tick all the boxes, do you think that's why you've maybe not been recognised? Maybe because... Yeah, sometimes, because it also happens, sadly, within our own community and that as well. A lot of the firsts that we've done in the past, like, like again, Bradford City, I've been working with them since 2007. And uh, prior to, like, um, posters and, and advertising boards going up and the ground rules and regulations being changed that season, we've got the announcers when the players come out onto the pitch to say we don't tolerate any racism or homophobic chanting and that we were the first team to do that in 2013 I'd been to various games in, in Germany and uh, at that point only uh, St Pauli and Hamburg were the only ever team in the world to fly a rainbow flag above the stands on their match on their home games so I took this idea back to Bradford City and, I, and in August um, 2013 for the first home game of the season they'd agreed to do an event weekend with us so we promoted everything in the local media uh, and the match day programme, we did stuff on social media and they asked the, the club if they would fly the rainbow flag at Valley Parade which I'd given them for that game and it still flies every home game to this day. So we were the only second club in the whole world to ever fly a rainbow flag 
uh, at the stadium around the world and that still stands to this day. It, yeah. it still flies every home game. Maybe they don't recognise you. Do you think maybe because you're outspoken you tell the truth? And... Maybe because I'm a little bit of a maverick and, yeah, and, uh, yeah. and I just tell things like they are uh, and we just get on, we do things, we don't have any, fund, any car funding behind us. From time to time we get donations, GMB, my trade union have supported me thankfully over the last couple of years to get things done, we've done lots of events and got lots of the resources out and supported lots of local prides and that across the country because our, our committee is spread around the country, there's two or three in London, Steve's in Nottingham, myself in, in Manchester, we're, got committee members in Bradford and, and Scotland and things. Do you get more done in Manchester than you do Bradford? No, not really, because oh. again, Manchester Pride don't recognise what we're doing. We still have to pay to have a stall at Manchester Pride and it's funding that we don't have coming in every year. At, at the moment, we've, we've not had any funding since um, we spent our last lot of funding in, in March this year, so anything we've had to do, myself and Steve, it's come out of our own pockets again to, you know, to get things done. We've been applying for a couple of years for awards for all, but sadly they've been prioritising uh, funding to go to the King's Coronation, so asking for several thousand pounds for just a ball game resources has been a big no, but you can put on um, a huge street party and, and get £90,000 to put on a party to support, support the King's Coronation. It's, the government surely have to start looking at things like this because you can't be having public funded money coming in by members of the public paying for, you know, taking their chance on a lottery ticket, but then decisions are being made by certain people within there as to what communities they can and can't have you tr Have you tried Bradford then because you didn't have much uh, luck? Oh, do yeah, we've done, like I say in the past, we've done lots of different events in Bradford and we're, we're working towards the uh, Bradford, we've got the City of Culture 2025, so we're in talks with the local people in Bradford. So you'll, you'll have more joy in Bradford than you would, which seems crazy to anyone who knows Bradford, just because there's a very high percentage you know, of Muslims, so you wouldn't think that, you think Manchester would take you more on. Yeah, we've not had a penny out of Manchester City Council, yeah. we've not had the slightest bit of support out of Manchester City Council. It's all been the, the smaller local LGBT are you a, sites. Are you a non-profit group or a charity? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're allowed to call ourselves a voluntary community, not-for-profit organisation. Okay.